Welcome and thank you for joining us on Zoom. I, I hope everyone is well. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. To begin with, I would like to thank our media sponsor, GNAT TV. Uh, not only do they provide the community with quality programs and local news, they have a library of our past lectures um, that they have videotaped. And in this era of Zoom, they take our recordings of our talks and edit them for future viewing on their website, on the local um, cable access TV. And then we share them as well on our weekly e-blasts and on social media. They are a wonderful community resource and we are grateful for their support. This evening's program is part of our Women 2020 series commemorating the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote and celebrating the accomplishments of women in many areas of society. It is a true honor to have Anne Galloway with us today. She is the founder and editor of Vermont Digger and the executive director of the nonprofit Vermont Journalism Trust. She has worked as a reporter and editor for over 20 years. She holds a BA from the University of Kentucky and moved to Vermont in 1988. For many years, Galloway was a contributing writer for Seven Days Newspaper and a visual arts reviewer for the Times Argus. She was the editor of the Sunday Rutland Herald and Barry Times Argus from 2004 to 2009. Her reporting has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the Vermont Life and City Pages in Minneapolis. In March 2017, she was a finalist for the Ansel Payne Award for Ethics and Journalism for her investigation into allegations of fraud at Jay Peak Resort. Galloway was also a finalist for the Investigative Reporters and Editors FOI Award in April of 2017. Thank you so much, Anne, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. We're delighted to have you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria. And thank you all for joining us this evening and, and uh, for listening to me talk about journalism. I really appreciate your taking the time. And um, so I will start sharing a screen. I have a little slide presentation and I promise I won't blather on too long and leave plenty of, t of time for questions. So I will get this going here. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how I started VT Digger in 2009. I was uh, at the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus as the Sunday editor, and I was laid off that year along with about 20 other people. And um, right away when I uh, thought about what I wanted to do, I, I realized that in order to continue in journalism that I would need to uh, basically start my own newspaper. But I, I didn't have... Um, you know, money uh, to start a print newspaper. Um, and so I thought that, you know, we would go on the web. And um, I developed a business plan. I worked with the Vermont, um, uh, the, um, the Vermont um, Business Development Corporation and, and came up with a, a business plan. And I called about 100 people uh, throughout the state to ask what they thought was missing in the media landscape. And uh, I came up with a business plan that didn't look so different from uh, the NPR affiliate model. And uh, I developed a, a board. Um, we had an advisory board to start. And uh, we kind of borrowed a 501c3. We had a fiscal agent uh, in Connecticut um, who basically thought that we had an opportunity to really make something of this effort. And the idea from the beginning was to focus on in-depth reporting and investigative news. And we started in September of 2009, 11 years ago, um, publishing two or three times a week. And I realized pretty quickly that um, in order to um, fulfill the business model and to do the kind of work that we thought uh, Vermont needed, that we would need to really pick up our game and uh, start producing daily news. Uh, the problem was that we didn't have enough money to hire any reporters. So um, I started, uh, I, I, I started um, working on that myself. I produced uh, uh, three to four stories a day um, and we published on a WordPress platform and uh, pretty soon we had a following. Um, I was in the state house and um, 
Um, we were covering everything from the budget to Vermont Yankee to um, economic policy and so on. And uh, within a few months, um, we had an audience of about 14,000 uniques a month. And, um, and we were off. So, um, you know, what happened to me at, at, at uh, the Sunday Rutland Herald and the Times Argus is something that has happened across the country over the past several decades. And um, last year, a group of journalists who were laid off um, put together a website that tracks um, how many newspapers have gone out of business, how many newsroom employees have um, uh, been laid off over time. And, you know, we're at a point now where uh, more than 40% of, um, of journalists in the field have, have been laid off. And that has a huge impact, as you all know, on local communities because it makes it impossible really for people to understand what's happening behind the scenes, behind closed doors and local government and state government. And there's a lack of cohesion in our society uh, when, when we lose newspapers. This has been happening for a long time um, and it's really as a result of the web. Um, you know, things have changed dramatically uh, we're all we're 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 all using these things now, and um, we uh, order stuff online. Uh, our attention, uh, you know, goes to digital media, and um, right now, uh, Google and Facebook really own most of the media buys in this country. Um, this group uh, says that 63% of digital ad revenue is controlled by Google and Facebook. Um, some people put those estimates much higher. I've seen uh, percentages as high as 80%. And what that means is that um, newspapers no longer have traditional uses, of, you know, traditional access to um, ad revenue. And that's really what sustained newspapers for decades. And ironically, um, newspapers uh, really made a lot of money back in the day. Um, the return on investment um, on average was about 18% um, until um, Google and Facebook really horned in on the scene. And the issue is that um, Google and Facebook have uh, millions of eyeballs. That's the ugly term of art for readers um, on the web. And uh, those, um, because they have economy of scale, they can sell ads at a much, much lower rate than local newspapers can. So, you know, the, the newspapers in Bennington and Manchester and St. Johnsbury up in the Northeast Kingdom where I live, if, if you have three to 5,000 readers in a region, you just simply don't have the scale um, to um, make the kind of ad revenue you need uh, to compete with Google and Facebook. So there's a serious business problem with media. It's been going on for a long time, but now we've hit kind of a crisis point with COVID. Um, so this, this is the uh, kind of reverse hockey stick uh, graph I like to show um, that helps you understand how there's been a real trade-off and, you know, there, there are academics um, and people in foundations across the country who are very concerned. Pew Research has done all kinds of um, uh, work on this issue. You know, there are grave concerns that every newspaper in the country could go out of business um, over the next three to five years. And that, that process is accelerating because of apprehension about, um, a, 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 about a potential um, deep, deep recession. I mean, we've kind of avoided that somewhat because of the stimulus early on during COVID, but who knows what's going to happen next year. So this is pre-COVID. Um, and, you know, this, is, uh, this slide is really an illustration of the, um, the attention economy. You know, you're one individual, you have your devices, you, you only have so many hours in the day to consume news and information. And all of us, our attention is divided and God forbid we actually spend time with our families too on top of all this, right? <laughs> um, so there have been a lot of studies about how um, the lack of reporting has really contributed to a crisis in our democracy. And this crisis is really um, pretty, uh, pretty evident even here in Vermont. You know, um, Gloria mentioned that I 
broke the stories about the Jay Peak fraud, for example, um, in the Northeast Kingdom. And uh, as a longtime reporter here in the state, I can tell you that it seems to me anyway, from my eye, that there has been um, more fraud uh, in our state than there was uh, before. Uh, Don Keelan, one of your neighbors down there has done a great job of tracking this issue. But, um, you know, we are seeing more embezzlements, we're seeing more fraud, um, we're seeing a disconnection between local people and their local governing bodies. Fewer poll workers, you know, during COVID people are, uh, the, the town clerks are having a terrible time finding enough poll workers who are willing uh, to be um, at election sites um, because of COVID now, um, but also because um, poll workers are an aging population. So this is uh, I, um, a, an image from a Pew Research study. Um, and here, this gives you a little more indication of what's been happening over time. The study's a little bit old, it's from three years ago, but it gives you some idea of how people are getting their news largely from Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Reddit and all these other um, basically aggregation sites. And none of these sites produce their own content. What they're doing is they're distributing information that's created by Newspapers in some cases, but uh, Russian trolls and others, right? So, you know, we're getting all kinds of information um, through these vehicles that aren't necessarily tied to the kind of traditions that journalism is hewed to. And um, while journalists are definitely imperfect, we all make mistakes and, um, you know, we do our best as journalists to correct mistakes and to make sure that we're accurate in the first place. Um, but these, uh, these types of social media have really uh, amplified fake news and um, news that's produced by people who just wanna make money in a way that you know, really I think had not been anticipated by anyone who created these channels. And now of course, Facebook and Google are really having a hard time managing the content, especially on YouTube, you know, vehicles like YouTube. Um, so you hear stories about um, Facebook having to hire thousands of people to review content um, on their platform um, because some of it is just um, very damaging to society. Um, so here's a little bit about Vermont's media landscape. We are not immune to these trends nationwide. Um, we have seen uh, quite a bit of shrinkage um, over the past couple of decades, and that means that um, uh, very basic uh, areas of concern are not being covered on a regular basis. And frankly, while we have grown uh, to a newsroom staff of 20, um, we are overwhelmed every day by tips from readers who are frustrated that we can't cover their issue. And frankly, those issues are real and they need to be covered. It's um, quite a news hole we're trying to make up for here. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that um, short of um, really dramatic changes in the way uh, we think about newspapers that this is going to change. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, our bread and butter coverage um, is in Montpelier at the State House, and the reason that we have become very engaged in State House reporting um, is because over time um, there have been fewer and fewer journalists available to cover what's happening there. I'm sorry about the phone. <laughs> Let me see if I can deal with that. Um, sorry about that. Um, and um, so I guess really what is um, dramatic here is that uh, when I first started working in the State House, there were, oh, 15 people there every day. Um, there were three reporters from the Free Press. There were a couple of people from the AP, um, three people from the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus. And that matters because um, if you care about a bill that's moving through, or you care about um, any aspect of state oversight, 
that coverage isn't happening in committee and a committee is where all the action is. And if you're only getting the information when um, bills come to the floor of the Senate or the House, it's really too late as a citizen to change anything, you know, to, to apply any pressure on your local lawmaker or to, um, you know, send a letter to the governor or whatever. And so I, when I started Digger back in 2009 and began covering the State House in 2010, I really um, focused on making sure that uh, readers had the information they needed to understand what was happening in that building because over the four month period um, when the legislature is in session, that is the only time as a news organization that we have an opportunity to really understand what's happening inside state government. Really the rest of the year, the only way we're able to get access to information uh, is through tips and public records requests and some interviews. And the legislature plays, you know, a, an amazing role in terms of, you know, really um, asking everyone who wants a piece of that budget to come in and justify uh, why they're there and to help people understand uh, why they're making cuts or why they're increasing staff and all of those things. And um, as, as a reporter, I think it's really important for us to understand how taxpayer dollars are spent. Um, this is a little bit about our mission. Um, we um, are really dedicated to a kind of watchdog journalism that um, is pretty old fashioned. We have beat reporters. Um, who cover uh, major public policy issues like healthcare and education, business, uh, the economy, politics, and so on. And um, the hold, we hold government accountable to the public by placing public records requests, by asking tough questions. Um, during COVID, for example, um, you know, I didn't make a big deal of this. It's something I did behind the scenes. Um, but I called Rebecca Kelly, the communications director for, um, for Phil Scott, and I said, you're not holding enough press conferences during COVID. We need more information. Um, and if I, it's not my job to give you advice, but the public is demanding answers, and you've got to talk to people more than once a week. And so they ended up holding three press conferences a week for an extended period of time. And that was very important um, in the spring so that people could really understand uh, what was happening. Um, and, you know, I think that the other thing that we did was um, we got a lot of feedback from readers about wanting more detail about who was getting COVID and where. And so we fought very hard to get information about how many cases there were per county. We also demanded to know how many cases per town. And we did this behind the scenes through public records requests. And then that became a kind of rallying cry um, at the press conferences early on. Uh, we also wanted to know hospitalization rates. Um, and so, and we all, you know, they would talk about certain um, nursing homes that had outbreaks and they wouldn't tell us how many people you know, had COVID in those facilities. So, you know, it, it's not always comfortable asking those tough questions, um, but we do it for the public. And, uh, and I say that um, uh, with, with real um, conviction because we literally take questions from readers and pose those to um, the governor and um, lawmakers and so on. So I think I've already told you a little bit about what makes us different. Here's more about, um, you know, how we break up our beats. Um, and we also have regional reporters. Um, before we got on the call, um, I was asked about our Southern Vermont reporter, uh, Emma Cotton, who's based in Rutland, and she's covering, covering Rutland and Bennington counties. We also have a reporter in Wyndham County, Kevin O'Connor, whose father, Timothy O'Connor, was Speaker of the House. Uh, a long, long time ago, I think back in the 80s. And so he understands Vermont very well. He's lived here his whole life and he's a real resource for us in Southern Vermont. Um, and I guess this is the other thing that is kind of shocking to me, but um, you know, we're a daily, we also produce investigative pieces, but we're, we're a daily newspaper and um, we produce a lot of content every day, eight to 10 
uh, pretty in-depth stories every day. And then we also um, produce data reports. And while back in the old days, that wouldn't have, wouldn't have been so remarkable, there are very few publications now that are producing that much um, reporting in a given day. We're, we're, we're publishing twice as much as seven days in Burlington and VPR on a given day. And, and we're also statewide um, in a way that some other newspapers aren't anymore in Vermont. Oops, I'm going backwards, sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, EV5 story that I broke back in 2014. And I think that um, what's important about the story is that it's the kind of thing that um, we're known for because we are pretty relentless um, on certain topics, and this is one of them. Um, we started reporting on this in 2014, um, two years before the state and the Securities and Exchange Commission um, decided to sue the developers for uh, misusing $200 million in foreign investor monies. Um, they uh, were accused of um, 52 counts of securities fraud and eventually um, they were criminally charged. But the reason I bring up this story is not so much about the content, which is important um, because this is the largest EB-5 fraud in the country and certainly the largest fraud in the, the state's ever experienced. Um, th this story's not over yet. Um, you know, the Vermont Regional Center was shut down. Uh, Ariel Kiros and Bill Stanger, the developers are still um, going through a criminal uh, court trial situation. Uh, Kiros pled guilty a few weeks ago and uh, Stanger's trial is, is coming up um, next year. Um, the reason I bring it up is because um, we have continued to write about this um, because we think it's important to stay on it. And um, I think we've produced more than 300 stories just on this one topic. And this is an example of the kind of relentless, tenacious reporting we do on a variety of topics. Um, and uh, this work is not easy. I mean, it, it um, requires a lot of, uh, a, a lot of not only stamina, but also some grit because um, you have things like this commentary I'm, I'm showing here that Patricia Moulton uh, sent to me right after we broke the first story about the fraud and she basically accused us of getting the story wrong. And, um, and it turned out that we were right. Um, but, and we were threatened with lawsuits and so on. And uh, we were also um, really treated pretty badly by the Shumland administration uh, through this period uh, because the state was really very much involved in allowing the fraud to go on for an eight year period. Um, you all invited me uh, as part of this, this uh, 19th Amendment um, event. And uh, I just did want to mention that, you know, the news business is a tough business and women um, weren't really a part of it until the 70s. Um, and uh, even now it's, it's, it's still a pretty uh, difficult um, way to go for women. Um, and a lot of it has to do with um, the kind of traditional way in which um, newsrooms have operated. Newsrooms are kind of like, uh, it's sort of like being in the army, you know, there, there's a hierarchy. There has to be because you're making trains run on time. Uh, and, you know, we're faced with um, having to make very quick decisions. And, um, and uh, as a result of that, it's, it's just a very traditional business. And uh, it's long been a sexist business, actually. And uh, it's really only been in the past decade or so that I think uh, women have risen to uh, positions in which they're leading newsrooms. Um, there's still very few um, CEOs of large newspapers across the country. Um, but I think that's going to change. Um, there are more women in, in leadership as time goes by. Um, and this, I don't know if you've read She Said, um, but this is uh, 
Jody Cantor and Megan Tui, the authors of that book about Harvey Weinstein and the work they did um, to uncover that uh, incredible um, sexual harassment case. Um, a lot of people ask me if nonprofit uh, news is, is, is going to be the future um, for news everywhere. And um, I, I think it's a pretty good bet actually. Um, and I say that because there aren't any profits in news anymore. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the ROI used to be 18% a year. I mean, it was in Burlington, I've been told that the Burlington Free Press had a few years in the 80s where um, they were making 50% profits. So um, those days are long gone. Um, but I, I wanted to tell you that the reason why I decided to go with a nonprofit model for news is because in addition to the fact that I kind of saw the writing on the wall in terms of profits, I also believe that it's really important for readers to feel that they have some buy-in um, in our work and that they understand that we're really committed to making sure that we pour every dollar we can right into, back into the news. And um, that's why Digger's a little bit different. Um, even as a nonprofit, we are very, um, focused on the newsroom. Uh, most of our employees are reporters and editors. We have um, 25, 26 people now on staff and 20 of them are in the newsroom. And that's very radical. Uh, you know, we probably need, we need a few more people on the business side at this point um, to kind of even things out a little bit. But, um, you know, we're not in it to make a profit. We're in it, this is a vocation. And um, we really want to make sure that um, we are transparent with the public about where money comes from and how we're spending it. And um, that's the reason why we're so focused on making sure that we have as many reporters as possible in the state. Um, to give you some idea of how different it is in other shops, um, you know, Seven Days, for example, has about 20 people in their newsroom, they have about 55 people on staff. So most of their staff is not actually not in the newsroom. Uh, VPR is pretty similar too. They, most of their people are not um, in the newsroom. They have other lines of business such as um, uh, the music station, but um, in a, at the Free Press, for example, and other for-profit commercial entities, um, again, uh, there are many more business people typically than there are people in the newsroom. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but um, if you look over to the right and if you're, uh, you know, you might be looking at me or, or some other people in a strip there, but if you, if you move your, um, your, your little strip of images over of the other members of the audience, you can see that um, our audience growth has really escalate over time. So we didn't have time to get the chart uh, just the way I wanted it. So we superimposed, two, we put two charts together. And one shows how we've, our readership has grown um, since 2009 to 2017. And then in 2018, we went up to about 400,000, between 350 and 400, it grew some more last year. And then with COVID, demand just went through the roof. And um, you know, we did have on average a million unique readers per month. So, you know, there, we, we think about 400,000 of those readers are actually from Vermont. The rest are from out of state. Um, and um, this has actually resulted in a lot of change in our company. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit about our revenue um, in the past couple of years, we have really beefed up membership and um, we've also received, we've been lucky enough to receive um, some very generous donations and that has enabled us to expand um, and to make sure that we have reporters located all over the state. Um, and last year we became part of the American Journalism Project, which is, uh, if you have a few minutes to look this up online, this is a really interesting um, startup company that basically is, is dedicated to helping small uh, local news organizations like ours really develop a model. Um, you know, there isn't a perfect model out there and uh, ours is pointed to as one of the best in the country. 
and um, we're part of this cohort of 10 other news organizations around the country and that are part of this experiment. And they're basically plowing um, grant money that comes from many sources uh, into our operations to see if we can continue to build on the success that we have so far. And the vision that we um, have worked on together is the idea that um, Digger will become a hub for more local efforts around the state um, as, as local journalism diminishes over time. So they gave us a grant of $900,000 um, over three years uh, to basically invest in our business office and uh, in our underwriting program, our, um, our membership program, and some of our e-commerce platforms, including obituaries and a PR portal. And then there was COVID. <laughs> and that's changed everything for everyone. So it's been quite amazing. Um, our reporters uh, are working from home. Uh, they, we are communicating entirely on Zoom. And, um, you know, as a result of the demand, I showed you that chart where, you know, demand kind of went up, you know, up, we, we just, the, the demand was unbelievable. Um, as a result of that, we have received um, double the number of tips, sometimes uh, triple the number of tips that we did in the past. Um, and we've also received a lot of questions from readers via email and through this tip form we have on our site. And so as a result of that, we've had to really uh, think hard about how we're assigning stories. And uh, in March and April, we received so many tips. And so many of them were very similar in nature. And they had to do with um, all kinds of things, everything from you know, grocery stores not having proper social distancing um, to nurses not having enough PPE and so on, uh, questions about the state data. Um, so we really um, upped our game. And through this period um, between March and the end of May, we were producing um, about 100 stories a week, sometimes 120 stories a week. And um, our reporters were, you know, just working incredibly hard. And so was the desk, the, uh, the editors. And um, we just wanted to meet the need. We wanted to make sure that people had all the information they needed. And... Uh, So um, these are some of the um, stories that we broke. We, uh, we had stories about test rationing around the state, um, surge plans that the state had developed. We placed a public records request to get the original data set for all of the surge plans. And then that became public um, as part of um, one of the press conferences later on. We also looked at hospital capacity around the state. Uh, we did an investigative piece about access to ventilators, and then we also looked at ethics policies. You know, the hospitals have different policies around who gets a ventilator, who gets um, an ICU um, bed, and, uh, you know, some of those policies were really controversial, and they were changed right before COVID. Um, we also looked at nursing home conditions around the state. Um, and then we had um, all of these new products that we just um, put together very quickly in order to meet the need. Now this gives you a sense of how quickly our email subscriber list grew. Uh, we went from about 27,000 subscribers to about 43,000 subscribers in a very short period of time. Uh, we also, um, the total number of users on our site, those are unique readers. Um, that, and what that means is that you might be on the site 10 times in a month or 100 times in a month, but you only count once because that's your IP address that comes to the site. We don't see your IP address, but Google does. And then Google sends us a report. Um, and so you can see that we've just had incredible growth um, in readership. And then we've had, a growth, we've had growth in membership as well. Um, well, this is a pretty phenomenal bump, um, and this was really heartening because at the height of um, COVID uh, in the spring, we were quite worried about uh, being able to continue our operations as they were, and we actually did go through a budget cutting exercise, and um, we cut a few jobs um, because we were so concerned about um, our budget going forward, and that was a good thing to do because 
um, while we've done okay, we, we, we weren't able to make up that difference. So, uh, but the membership has really um, helped to sustain us through, um, through the summer. Um, and then this is the last si slide, I promise. <laughs> uh, the, the, I just wanted to give you a kind of sneak preview of, of upcoming attractions. And uh, we are going to be starting some pilot projects around the state um, to cover particular towns and areas that um, are really being left out right now. And uh, we're also going to be looking at covering certain communities that we really don't have enough information about and that we want to be, um, we want to do a better job of covering and really reporting for those communities instead of reporting on them. And I'll give you an example. You know, we do a lot of crime reporting. Um, Alan Keyes is our crime reporter and he uh, wants to stay on top of, of um, those issues. And, but there are some underlying problems that we're really not covering there. And we have um, a pretty large uh, population of very low income Vermonters and that we don't really cover. Um, and uh, we're going to look at how we can do a better job of understanding um, the needs of all Vermonters. Um, and uh, we're going to keep going with uh, our coverage of, of COVID and the socioeconomic <laughs> crisis that we're um, potentially faced with. So I'm gonna stop uh, sharing the slides now and uh, take your questions. So when you were in college, was you studied journalism? No, I, I studied, I was pre-med and, uh, and, and, and then I switched over, to, I couldn't hack organic chemistry and uh, I, I switched over to English Lit. But I, I, I always uh, enjoyed writing and um, Actually, when I was in high school, I, I really knew I wanted to be a reporter then, but um, my parents um, were very um, religious and uh, they were concerned about um, that uh, particular vocation. So they kind of discouraged that. So I, I went pre-med instead. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a question uh, from Anne Graham. Are you familiar with the solutions Journalism Network founded by David Borstein. If yes. What kind of impact do you think their work has had? That's a good question, Anne. I, I am familiar with them. Uh, we have not had a project here in Vermont with them, but I know they've done very good work in uh, Seattle, Washington, and uh, in other places around the country. And I, I think it's a very intriguing concept. I've tried to think about, you know, how we might be able to work with them. Um, and, you know, I, th I think it's, it, for, for those of you who don't know, the idea is that um, reporters would take an, take an issue and really report on solutions to that problem and, um, and then convene um, people around uh, that idea. And I've actually never, um, I've actually never participated in one of these uh, events, and so what do you know about it? What do you, what do you think about it? Uh, so I, I, um, I've been intrigued. I met David um, in New York um, about 10 years ago um, after he had written his book, um, How to Change the World. <laughs> and, um, and that was be long before he, he created solutions-based um, reporting. But the, for me, the concept is that there's so much negative reporting and there's, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, you know, investigative reporting of the kind that you do is so important, but, but I feel there isn't enough um, reporting about um, what's working and why, mm -hmm. particularly with respect to public policy, um, mm -hmm. but also I'm a, I'm a journalist and I cover um, uh, the role of business and society. Uh, and so for me, it's, you know, how corporations are, you know, productively doing things in the world. Um, and so for me, solutions-based journalism has really been, um, an, you know, a way for me to tell stories that aren't normally reported. I, I, I think it's definitely worth pursuing. And um, yeah, we don't do enough of, of that kind of coverage for sure. And I, I think it's... I, it's definitely something that we're 
looking at um, going forward. In fact, I think, you know, really with COVID, um, I think that story ultimately was about what was working because the government was really responsive in a way that I think um, galvanized people and shocked people. And, um, and that was a really fascinating experience for us. I think it was the first time our journalists had felt really needed in that way. You know, we were answering questions every day about, you know, how to go to the grocery store without getting COVID or, you know, how, you know what do you do? Do you have to wipe down all your food? You know, should you wear a mask? All those kinds of questions that people had. It was the first time we had experimented with an FAQ knowledge base. You know, we were basically just answering questions people had. And, um, and that was a, a really fun experiment. And I'd like to try that again. So thank you for making that suggestion. The next question from Anthony Surratt, what's the number one piece of advice you have for people thinking about following your footsteps into the not-for-profit news business? Oh, gosh. Um, hmm. I, I guess it really boils down to um, deciding whether you have the um, strength to do it if you're starting out as an individual. Um, and then surrounding yourself with with people who uh, really believe in it too, um, because it's a very difficult um, path. Uh, I think it's worthwhile, but it's very difficult um, because well, here's how I describe it. It's like running. Um, it, it, it's like running an ER, not knowing where the money's coming from to pay the doctors. <laughs> You know, you're constantly trying to, you know, triage stories and move things through and make sure you're taking care of everything. And then you also have to worry about the back office, you know. But the interesting thing I've learned and that I think is, um, you know, what AJP was interested in is that the two are connected. That part of the reason why I was trying to show you the story of need around COVID was because really the money that we bring in to support the operations directly tied to our value proposition, to the value we have to, to readers. If readers think we're doing a good job, they'll, they'll contribute. If they don't, they won't. And, you know, that it, we're, we're very close to our readership in that way. We're accountable to the readership. And um, that's both a, a wonderful thing and it's also nerve wracking, you know, because you have to stay on your game. And, um, and, and the game can change, you know, the game can be not just the kind of traditional um, shoe leather reporting and investigative reporting we do, but it can also be the kind of thing that Anne brought up, which is really answering those big questions, what's working and what isn't, and how is it working? and you know, we're at a point in our democracy and our society now where we've got a lot of problems and uh, be nice to know how to solve them. The, the tricky part is that journalists typically, that, that's sort of a very non-traditional role for journalists, right? I mean, our job is to ask the questions, not to provide the answers. Um, with solutions journalism, it's a, it, we're, we would be finding different kinds of answers. And that, that's, a, that's a, a different way of seeing the world and an important way to see the world that we need to to get more comfortable with. Uh, Nancy Morris asks, how do you decide the beat categories or is that standard throughout journalism? It is not standard anymore. I think it used to be. Well, it used to be that newspapers like the Washington Post or the New York Times would have individual reporters who were had very small beats. And you still see this sometimes with business reporters and knows, you know, like with um, the Wall Street Journal or, you know, with the, with the business press, you might have someone who just covers Facebook, you know, or just covers the steel industry or whatever. Um, the, the beats that, I, that um, we came up with at Digger really have to do with public policy and how it moves through the legislature. And then it's sort of also a representation of the big uh, and institutions in our state. Um, and um, that institutional coverage, I think, is important to all Vermonters, but um, it really came out of reporting at the State House. 
I was uh, covering committees and I was jumping from healthcare to education to economic development to, you know, the budget or whatever. And uh, as we grew, when we started, you know, it was just me and, and a, f a few other uh, people um, who freelanced. Uh, and I just came up with that beat system really as a function of doing the reporting myself and realizing what seemed to be most important to Vermonters. And um, so that's how we came up with the beats. Um, but most newspapers now do not have strict beats like this uh, because they're too small. And so they might have a political reporter or two, or they might have one education reporter, but it, you know, we're the only newspaper in the state that I know of that has uh, beats like this. And around the country, you know, the people in my cohort with the AJP project, most of them are, um, they're, they're working on very different kinds of projects than we are. Um, so they don't have the same kind of beat reporting structure either. We're a little bit of a unicorn that way, partly because we're covering the whole state. Um, we're such a small state, we can cover the whole state in a way that, you know, um, Berkeley side in Berkeley, California, you know, that's a city of 300,000 people. They're now also moving into Oakland. That's 500,000 people. They have very different issues to cover in those municipalities that, you know, are quite different from Vermont, which, you know, it has, uh, <laughs> we're, we've got mountains and, um, uh, and 626,000 people. It's a really small state. It's a neighborhood in Brooklyn or a small, you know, Midwestern city. I have a couple questions here from uh, Dave Galibersuch. What is the demographics of your staff? And can you tell us more about the Local Journalism Sustainability Act? Yes. Uh, so you're asking where the reporters are located? Is that the question? Okay. Okay, good. All right. So we... Um, Right now, everyone's at home <laughs> working from, from their laptops, um, but they're, um, we have two reporters in Southern Vermont. We have one reporter in the Northeast Kingdom. I live in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and then we have um, one reporter who uh, is in Burlington, reporting on Burlington. About half of our staff, age and gender, okay. So age, okay. Uh, we, we have, a lot of 20 somethings and we have old people like me. It's pretty much that mix. <laughs> We've, it's like, uh, uh, we're starting to get some people who are um, in, the, in, in the prime of their lives work-wise. Uh, I think we have two people in their mid thirties, early forties. Um, you know, it's a great question because um, one of the things that's happened over the past 15 or 20 years is that there's been a kind of hollowing out. As I said at the beginning, we've lost 32,000 journalists. So a lot of those people were kind of in their prime, the height of their careers. And um, that's a shame because it's now very difficult to hire people with um, kind of mid-level experience. And um, that's, that's really problematic. So we actually have worked very hard on uh, developing a pipeline of young reporters who are really bringing up over time. So we have um, three, um, uh, let's see, we have five editors over the age of 55. Um, we have two reporters who are in that age range. And then the rest of our newsroom staff is under the age of uh, 32. Um, gender, Boy, I don't know if I can give you the gender breakdown off the top of my head because it's been changing. Um, we've had a few people leave and more people come. I think right now we probably have one or two more males than females in the newsroom. In the business office, we have um, uh, four women and three men. That includes the web developers, technically not on staff, but so. Derek Boothby asked, do you get much pushback from authorities, the Scott administration, police, business? Yes, all of the above we do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless it's something they want to tell us, <laughs> then it's easy. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I would say, though, that um, the Scott administration has been easier to work with on a number of different issues than the Shumlin administration. Um, they, the Shumlin administration really um, 
uh, took umbrage at my coverage of the JPEAK um, situation. So we were shut out um, of a lot of things. Um, but, you know, we still have a very difficult time with the uh, Department of Corrections, for example. We've been suing the Department of Corrections for two years now over um, records pertaining to a superintendent of Southern State um, Correctional Facility over in Springfield. Um, there were allegations that the superintendent had been involved in sexual activities at the prison, and we still... Uh, don't have those records. Um, we're still grinding that through the courts. It's really been a drag. Um, and uh, business, is, business is tough. Um, business is always hard. Um, you know, you can't, you can't rely on public records there, so it's, it's all interviews. Um, I'm working on a story right now about a private business that um, is quite difficult. Um, and uh, it's really just um, dozens and dozens of interviews to get at the information because you have to confirm things over and over and over again to be sure that it's true um, because you don't want to engage in, in, um, in investigative stuff. You have to be just so careful. Um, how, did, how did you uncover the JP story? Was it a tip? Yes, I, I got a tip um, and um, I had heard that um, there were complaints from investors that had been sent to state officials and the investors were upset because um, the state officials were not responding or they were telling them to talk to Bill Stanger or Ariel Kiros about what was happening. And this had to do with the seizure of the Tram House Hotel. Um, Ariel Kiros seized, seized ownership of that hotel. He basically um, gave the investors a 10-year loan he was supposed to pay them back after five years, but instead um, basically said, oh, you know, we'll pay you back over 10 years, which would have been 15 total. So um, I got this tip. I met with a state official uh, in uh, after hours in the dark at his office, and he handed me, you know, a bunch of printed emails uh, because he didn't want that information to be um, transferred over the state servers through email. And um, I spent about three weeks um, bugging the hell out of everyone who had written to the state, begging them to talk to me. Um, and after about three weeks, um, Tony Sutton, who became the leader of this dissident group of investors, called me up. And um, it was uh, 4th of July weekend, 2014. And I was so excited. I started jumping up and down on the porch because I knew this was going to be a great story. <laughs> and, and then Tony gave, you know, he, the first thing he said was, um, we've looked you up. We think we can trust you. We want to, we want to give you every, you know, all the information we have. And uh, so that's what I got started. And um, the funny thing was I had another reporter who was working on the story and I called Hillary up and I said, Hillary, we've got to meet with, um, we've got to meet with Bill Stanger. Tell Bill we want a tour of the new Hotel J. And so <laughs> we burned up there and we get there and um, he wants to give us a tour. And uh, we said, well, why don't we start with the, uh, why don't we start with the conference room? And we, we were in the conference room for three hours and the two of us were like a sea, you know, we were just it was like a saw, we we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with questions. And by the end of it, he was so upset. And we, we drove back to my house in Hardwick and we pounded out the story and sent it to my attorney to look at it, to make sure that, you know, we didn't have anything libelous in it. You know, we had to go through all the documents that Bill had given us that, Tony Sutton had given us and we double checked everything and uh, we ran the story on that Sunday and um, by five o'clock I'd gotten a nasty email from Bill Stanger and he insisted that we meet him the next day in our offices uh, because he was going to be in Montpelier and I said sure of course so we met him the next day and he spent an hour just raging at us <laughs> And we were both terrified he was going to have a heart attack, you know, because his face was all red and he was getting really, really mad. And he wanted to, he, he wanted us to wait to run the story until he gave us the LPA, the limited partnership agreement, but we already had it. He didn't know that we already had the LPA from Tony. So we were able to run the story anyway. So it was a, it was a great moment. Um, and then of course, like 
a couple days later, we got this commentary from Bill saying the story was all wrong. And uh, a couple days after that, Pat Moulton, who ran the Vermont Regional Center, uh, sent us this commentary saying the story was all wrong. We knew we were right. I knew we were right because we had the documents. And I'd interviewed all kinds of, you know, I'd interviewed securities attorneys and I'd gone down the well on this thing big time and I knew we were right. So we just stuck to our guns and kept going. And then eventually, you know, they, um, Governor Shumlin behind the scenes, I didn't know it, but in September of that year, he uh, formed an MOU with the Department of Financial Regulation and they, this, there was a, a, a young hotshot attorney there, Michael Pichak, who happens to be down from Wyndham County, um, was uh, brought on to um, take on their investigation of what happened. But the truth is the state, state must have known uh, for years at that point and really engaged in a pretty sophisticated cover-up, which I'm still working on um, trying to really break the back of. I mean, I'm still, I'm, I'm going for my third lawsuit, okay? <laughs> I, I just, I, I mean, I've got, I've got, oh my God, it's such a nightmare. But um, at any rate, last year we sued and we found out that they just, they, that there were four months of documents missing. Um, this time Cornell Law School is going to bat for me and uh, the First Amendment Center there. And uh, we're, 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 we're going to run up the flagpole one more time. And we're basically going to ask for all the documents that I requested in 2016 that they told me that I need to fork over $200,000 for. So <laughs> anyway, it'll be fun to see what happens. So I just placed the public records request yesterday. And, uh, you know, I doubt they're going to give them to me, but you never know. They, they have released uh, about 700,000 pages. There are 3 million pages of documents. The 700,000 pages of documents are in a really indecipherable MSG file system. And I'm using this program through Google called Backlight that allows you to OCR um, static PC PDFs. Um, and they basically, you know, you, you can't scan a PDF. You can't search for keywords but this program allows me to search the documents for keywords. So I've entered this thing in, and um, uh, I, I think I have about 500,000 pages up and I don't see the name of a single state official on any of the documents. So that's how well they, they screen them for information about the state regional center. Cause that's all I'm after. I want to know what they knew and when they knew it, but um, I don't know. I might be dead before that happens. Somebody got me going on JP. <laughs> I should so, get off that topic. <laughs> I'm going I'm to back up a little bit because I forgot to stay on Dave's second question. Can you tell us more about the Local Journalism Sustainability Act? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I'm going to cheat because I don't know a heck of a lot about it. So I, I did a quick search before we started. Okay. Uh, okay. It's a, about the bill. Non-refundable tax credit for consumers of up to $250 uh, to incentivize individual subscriptions to local news organizations. There is a refundable tax credit for local newspapers of up to $25,000 in the first year for each employee or independent contractor who's a qualified journalist and up to $15,000 in the subsequent four years. And then there's a non-refundable tax credit for small to medium-sized businesses to advertise with local newspapers. The credit can cover up to $5,000 of advertising costs in the first year and $2,500 in the subsequent four years. Um, yeah, I don't know if that would work or not. I mean, I think that's probably too little too late. I, I, I think that might, I think that the, um, this Local Journalism Sustainability Act is a noble effort and I hope it passes. Um, but I don't know that it would be enough to save local newspapers. I think it might be too little too late. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that would be needed to really rescue newspapers in this country. And I don't see it coming anytime soon. Unless Google and Facebook are forced to um, uh, engage in a transfer of wealth. And I don't think that's happening either. <laughs> All right. Um, we have another question. How will we counter de the deliberately misleading fake news label certain politicians try to pin on responsible journalists? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't have an answer to that question. I mean, before Donald Trump started beating up on journalists publicly, I mean, 
Peter Shumlin kept saying that I worked for the National Enquirer. So this is an old thing. It's not, it's not new. Um, you know, politicians have beaten up on reporters for a long time. It's just more visible now than it used to be. I, I don't know how we solve this problem. I think, um, you know, hug a journalist. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is kind of God's work, you know, people hate on you a lot. So we do need uh, a lot of moral support. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say, except that it's incredibly sad. And um, I do think that um, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm very proud to be from Vermont and in a place where journalists generally are still well respected. And, you know, I, I think that Phil Scott treats us with really great respect and it's, it's wonderful. Um, you know, and I think the respect is mutual. And he actually um, produced a video in the spring encouraging people to donate to local newspapers. Did you see that? He was on Twitter and there was like a little video of the governor uh, encouraging people to support media, which is amazing. Who else does that? <laughs> so I guess if politicians could do that, that would make a difference. Uh, but it's not really something we as journalists can do much about. Uh, we have a Bennington resident who asks if you foresee the Banner and Manchester Journal closing, and if so, would Vermont Digger uh, fold some of the new staff into your new into your new staff and offer local focus for South Southwestern Vermont? Well, I hope they can hang in there. I mean, I think that Birdland Group. Um, based in Massachusetts is, is really uh, working hard. I think they're, they're trying hard. Um, if they go under, yes, we would, we, we would do what we could to make up the difference. Absolutely. We have this question uh, from Mark Schumann. What process, processes are in place to get the 20 somethings to become seasoned and not make major embarrassing mistakes? Hmm, yes. Uh, it is hard. I mean, I think that the key is really beefing up our editing desk, um, which is something that I've worked very hard on over the past two or three years. Um, we need to have, they need uh, backup support and they need to be, they need to be encouraged to ask the right questions. And um, we've also worked very hard to improve our vetting process for interns and for new reporters. That said, um, young reporters, sometimes do make mistakes. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I was telling you earlier that sort of heartbreaking to, it's heartbreaking to lose this um, group of middle-aged journalists because they have the experience and the knowledge base in a given region to prevent their own mistakes. And that can be difficult. Um, in our case, um, we do have some depth of knowledge on the desk because we have people who've lived here their whole lives and who know something about Vermont and who've followed the news. And actually, I really look back on my time in the State House. I, I don't get to spend much time in the State House anymore, um, but I did quite a bit of time there. I, I reported there um, really solidly for seven years. And um, as a result of that, um, I have a lot of background knowledge about a lot of different issues around the state. Um, but that, you know, doesn't prevent us from making mistakes necessarily. So it's, it's always something we're, we're working on. And we, we also um, hear from readers when we make mistakes. And we appreciate that, you know, we want people to tell us when we've screwed up, we don't, we don't like screwing up. When we do screw up, we want to know about it. Um, and so we have a report and error form at the bottom of every story so that you can let us know if we've done something wrong. And you can always call me. You can, my cell phone's on the website. Um, my email's on the website. I don't have a life, uh, but you can contact me. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. So, and, and you know, what I'll do is I'll, I, I take those things and I pass them on to the desk and then they, um, they handle corrections and so on. But we, we've, um, I, I think, really in the past um, six months, we've made some changes that have really helped with that in terms of our editing process. But it's always, it's always something we're working on. 
Okay, Reg Jones asks, um, it is disturbing that AP and other print media are not covering the State House. Are there pool reporters to serve those outlets? Do you pool with other news groups such as VPR or Seven Days? And is it still a race against others to get a scoop? Well, um, we do have a news service for local newspapers around the state. Um, our state house news, our state news is distributed to, I think now we're down to about eight news organizations around the state, maybe nine. Um, we've had some drop out over time for financial reasons. So um, the Bennington Banner, the Reformer, and the Journal used to take our news um, for a small fee, and they backed out a few years ago, which was disappointing. But um, we don't have a collaborative relationship with Seven Days. We do compete with them. Um, frankly, um, they're competing with us because uh, they were always an arts and entertainment uh, alternative newspaper and about five years ago they saw that we were gaining a lot of traction and they started um, horning into our our niche so um, but at any rate you know that we unfortunately we don't have a collaborative relationship I actually went to them at that time and suggested that we could work together but um, that didn't wash so um, not much to do there. With VPR, they, uh, until March, were taking our news briefs um, every day. Uh, they would um, basically read our, uh, our news on the air. They still pick up our news sometimes. They're not paying for it, but they'll sometimes give us credit for it. Um, but we did has, have a news brief um, project with them. We had a joint project um, on uh, an investigation of what really happened with the Kaya Morris story. And we did that together uh, in March. We published the story on March 8th, just five days before um, the uh, World Health Organization uh, announced that COVID was a pandemic. And so that story that we worked for, for more, on for more than a year kind of got buried by bigger news. But uh, we did work on that project with VPR and we would like to do more projects with them in the future. But um, we've all been kind of, uh, running around crazy with uh, the news cycle over the past six months. So we haven't had time to have those conversations, but um, I have sat down with um, Scott Finn a number of times and we've had really good conversations and we've talked about collaborating in a couple of different ways. So I expect that will happen in the future. Um, yeah, unfortunately it is, it is a competitive business. So we are, you know, but it's less competitive than it used to be. And frankly, the more competitive um, the media is, the better it is for readers because, um, you know, it does uh, mean that more news gets out there. So I was always disappointed that we didn't, we didn't have much competition on the J Peak stories. That, that's too bad. I think that if there had been more competition, more news would have come out and uh, we all could have put more pressure on the state to release records and to come clean on their involvement, but that never happened. So. I don't know, but we do try to rally around stories. So if other people have great stories that they're working on and we miss it, we will do follow-up stories and uh, try to get back in there uh, to compete so that, um, and that's, that's actually a way of honoring the news organization that has done the primary work. Um, because at the end of the day, if we all don't rally together around certain stories, um, information doesn't come out. Um, I think we'll, uh, we're just about to wrap up. Um, I, ha I do have a comment here from Marguerite. Um, sh she says, I would like more in-depth coverage of, your, of the legislature. It mm -hmm. seems they, that there are going to be some major battles over the budget and I would appreciate major coverage. Thank you for that. I will pass that on to the team. I think you're right. The budget is going to be a, a real football this time and it's, it's much harder now to cover the legislature because it's all Zoom meetings. So a lot of the best reporting is uh, really from what you hear in the hallway, you know? It's, it's not what you hear in the Zoom meeting, which is kind of an official event. Um, so in order to really get the skinny on this, it means a lot more legwork with um, people outside the Zoom meetings. And I'll make that suggestion. So thank you for that. 
We also need to really uh, cover Act 250 carefully because I think that's going to be a big issue coming up in the legislative session, along with the marijuana tax and reg bill. And um, also don't forget the CARES Act money. That's, that's going to be, there's going to be more of that that um, needs to be decided on. So yeah, there's a lot happening. And unfortunately, it's happening right in the middle of the election cycle. Mm -hmm. So that'll really, this is unique. We've never had this before. So um, I just want to thank you, Anne. This was really um, great to have you with us. Um, you're an inspiration. And um, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us here tonight. Please visit our website. Um, I, hope you'll, I hope I'll see you at more of our programs. And if you have suggestions uh, for the types of programs you'd like to see as well, please let us know. Um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gloria.